Welcome to Afternoon at the Museum. And today, whoa, there are lots of things going on in the world, folks, today. But we are here to take you away from all that and take you out to the ball game. No, I don't have any music to back that up. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I'm Janine Stanley, and I am the IRA Explorer Community Manager. And with us today, we have a bunch of special guests. First off, we have Mr. Paul Schrader from IRA with some special guests that are joining us remotely today. Hey, Paul. Hello, Janine. Hey. So who's joining you out there? Excellent. Hey, Janine, we are so glad to be doing this in conjunction with the National Federation of the Blind of Maryland's convention. All right. Today. And so we're <laughs> part of that. And, you know, if I had been thinking in advance, I would have put on my Homestead Grays t-shirt, which I do have, uh, in honor of one of our local, local teams uh, from the Negro Baseball League. Which we are going to hear about today. I also have with me Mr. Ryan Bishop, our amazing YouTube guy, handling the technology Hello, in the background. Everyone. Hello, everyone. Glad to be here. Super excited for our special guests and museum today. And with that, I am going to turn this over. We have our host, Stephanie Watts, is joined again by Paul Mims. And our very special guest today, he is the Vice President of Curatorial Services at the Negro League Baseball Museum, Mr. Ray Doswell. So, Stephanie, take it away. Well, <clears throat> hello, everyone. And pardon my uh, tickly throat here. <laughs> um, welcome to Afternoon at the Museum. And um, I'm so excited to be joined by everyone today. Um, I, I think I'm just going to um, settle back and allow Ray to take us away. Well, hello, uh, everyone. And uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, to speak with you today. Uh, we're excited to be able to tell you about the history of African Americans in baseball uh, with the emphasis on the Negro League. So we appreciate you all listening. And for those who can, I do have uh, slides uh, that I will run through uh, that will showcase some of the history and uh, help us describe um, this aspect of African American history and how it relates to our broader American story. So uh, again, I'm Raymond Doswell. Uh, I am Vice President of Curatorial Services here at the museum. That's a fancy title. Uh, I was joking yesterday that really I'm just the head janitor here. <laughs> I take <laughs> care of, of things when there's a mess and, and, and make sure that things are working appropriately here at the museum. Uh, this slide talks about my background. I uh, have a doctorate in education from Kansas State University. Um, uh, and uh, I also have done historical research from the University of California, Riverside. I attended Monmouth College in Monmouth, Illinois. Uh, uh, way back in 1991 is when I got my degree. So I'm not a spring chicken by any means. Uh, mm. But... Uh, I am originally from St. Louis uh, area, uh, went to high school in East St. Louis, and I am a lifelong St. Louis Cardinals baseball fan. And even though I live here in Kansas City, I've lived here for now 25 years in Kansas City, and it is a very unique sports town, um, mainly because of its history. Um, I think those of you who get to travel across the country know if you cheer for your hometown team, you never lose that. And certainly that's the case in baseball. And the Cardinals mean a lot to me, uh, but we do enjoy our Kansas City Royals here uh, who uh, have had some up and down seasons since I've been here. But one of those has included uh, two World Series appearances and a World Series championship. Uh, although I tease them, our Cardinals have won about 13 World Series, but that's beside the point. <laughs> uh, still, uh, the being in Kansas City, it is a great sports town and a great sporting experience, and we have a great relationship here at the museum with our Kansas City Royals, who are a great supporter. Um, but I do represent the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. Uh, the museum was founded in 1990 in a small one-room office 
uh, by a number of local individuals, uh, historians, uh, former baseball players, and civic leaders who want to preserve the rich history that is here uh, in this neighborhood where we're located that also includes a rich African-American jazz history. The museum uh, as it currently sits is in a 10,000 square foot facility, which is actually shared by another museum, the American Jazz Museum as part of a larger project that began in the, in the uh, late 1980s, early 1990s. But this facility did open in uh, November of 1997. Uh, it includes a, what we like to call a mock baseball stadium. Uh, this, uh, so that's what we want you to feel like when you walk into the space. Uh, you would walk around uh, experiencing a timeline of African-American and baseball history uh, with an emphasis, as I said, on the professional Negro Leagues. Hundreds of photographs, uh, lots of artifacts, uh, and everything is centered around a mock baseball diamond uh, which we call the Field of Legends. There are life-size bronze statues of some key figures in African-American baseball history uh, when you get there. Uh, and they're all placed in their base positions. Um, and this simulated night baseball game of all stars, if you will, uh, of players. And we even have a statue of the umpire. Uh, but the idea is that you're separated from the field or segregated from the field before you can actually walk out there. You need to go around through the timeline. There are films that you can watch as well. Uh, but you go around the timeline, learn the history, and then you earn the right to walk onto the field among the legends who are immortalized. Many of the players who are models for the statues are honored by the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, okay. New York. Yeah. Okay. Ray, uh, I think we lost you. Oh. Nope. Um, can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you. And I can hear you. You're right. We've got you. Okay. I can hear you all. So all are we good? Yep. <laughs> okay. I can hear you. Stephanie. Okay. Okay. Yep. Oh, okay. we, we also have Julia here, our agent, too. So if there is something, Stephanie, that's on the slides that you might want to hear about, we have Julia here to describe them as well. Yes. And, and I... Um, I'm so intrigued by this journey into the field is, of... Yeah. That, that, I <laughs> love that concept. It, and I, I, I was thinking of asking a question just when I lost Ray. So uh, I'll be uh, quiet and let you go ahead, Ray. Oh, well, that's okay. Um, <laughs> I should point out, you can't see from my images, but uh, when you walk into the space, uh, initially into the turnstiles, and we have metal turnstiles, there is a chicken wire fence that separates you from the field of legends, which is the end of the exhibit, but you, it's the first thing you see when you walk in. Mm -hmm. uh, and the chicken wire is important. Well, because in an old baseball stadium, something like chicken wire was used behind the catcher and the backstop to separate you from the, uh, from the field if you were a fan so that you wouldn't get hit by a baseball. Mm -hmm. But also, in some places where there was segregated seating for blacks and whites, chicken wire was a device used to separate the audience. So uh, it is meant to give you more reverence when you walk onto the field and earn that right. Uh, it, it becomes more important for you to understand the journey in which these baseball players had endured uh, for this great place of honor. And Ray, you may mention this later, so um, forgive me if I'm jumping ahead, but you were talking about the legends, um, field of legends, and the uh, statues are in their base positions. Uh, we're talking about all nine positions or just? Um, no. uh, yeah, all nine positions, okay. plus we have a batter, uh, catcher, and an umpire. And actually, there's a total of 13 statues all together. Um, uh, and um, I could run through them very quickly and show you a few of them. Uh, one, uh, the batter here I'm demonstrating is Martin de Higo. And so it's interesting to note him because he is from Cuba and one of the great 
stars uh, uh, of Cuba who also played in the United States uh, and was a great star pitcher primarily, but we have him as our batter here on our field of legends. Um, catching is the great Josh Gibson, a uh, player that many may have heard of. Uh, Buck, mm-hmm. Buck Leonard is at first base. At second base is John Henry Pop Lloyd from Florida. I should point out uh, Leonard's from North Carolina. Gibson, born in Georgia, but was a star in Pittsburgh. Um, playing shortstop is William Judy Johnson uh, from uh, Delaware. Uh, third base, Ray Dandridge, um, who was born in Virginia. A uh, great third baseman and played in many places across the country and in Latin America. Um, in the outfield uh, on left field is James Thomas Cool Papa Bell, <laughs> one of the fastest <laughs> men in baseball history. Uh, center field, Oscar Charleston. Oh, Bell is from Mississippi, I should point out, but uh, spent uh, most of his life in St. Louis, but played all over as a superstar player. Oscar Charleston, the great Oscar Charleston, center fielder from uh, the Hoosier Comet from Indianapolis. Uh, really a star in the pre-Negro Leagues, uh, which I'll explain the, the periodization, uh, but uh, also a great center fielder and manager. And uh, the other outfielder is Leon Day. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about Leon Day for our Maryland audience uh, in, in a moment. And, and Josh uh, Gibson probably too, if anyone's been to Nats Park, uh, certainly would know would know of him. Because he's a, a legend in Pittsburgh, but also in Washington, D.C., yeah as the national, as the, excuse me, the Homestead Grays played uh, both in Pittsburgh and Washington. Uh, I'm showing now the uh, image of the umpire statue because that was a recent addition. Um, uh, we added a, a statue of umpire Bob Motley. We didn't have an umpire for the first few years here, but uh, Mr. Motley was a, a, a umpire in the later Negro Leagues, one of the last living umpires, and uh, we've added a statue of him as well. Um, we've added an exhibit on women in baseball, women in the Negro Leagues which also includes not full statues, but uh, busts or heads of uh, specifically three women with an impact on the leagues that played in the 50s after integration. That's uh, uh, Connie Morgan, Tony Stone, and, Ma- and Mamie Peanut Johnson. Uh, Mamie Johnson, before her passing just a few years ago, settled in Washington, D.C., and that's where she lived uh, and did a number of appearances in and around the community there. Uh, but this exhibit is called Beauty of the Game and talks about their role as, long, as well as uh, women ownership uh, in uh, Black baseball. And Ray, if I can jump in here real sure. quick and ask, um, Julia, mm-hmm. do you um, see the different uniforms that they're wearing? And I, I realize if you do, probably don't want to describe all of them, but if you can maybe pick um, the uniform of... Uh, one of the legends and describe it. Okay, so I'm currently looking at the ladies. So are you wanting to hear about the ladies or the guys on the field? Well, maybe one from each group. How about okay, that? let's go with the ladies here. I have Tony Stone is in the center and I've got a nice view of her. And in the foreground is the bust that Ray was describing. And you can see she has curly ear length hair underneath her baseball cap. And then there's a full uh. photograph of her. Is that the same person, Ray? Is that? Yes. Okay. So Tony Stone, a full photograph of her on the wall. It looks to be probably about life-sized, right? Close. And um, she's wearing, does her uniform say clowns? Was that the team? That's right. So okay. the, the team was the Indianapolis Clowns. She played for one or two other teams, but that was one of the noteworthy teams at the end of the leagues, and they're the ones who recruited the women to play. That's so cool. So she is wearing a jersey that says clowns and this sort of very pretty script across the front. And it's a V-neck jersey that comes down to her elbows and then it looks like she has longer sleeves underneath and belted big baggy pants. And she has a ball, looks like just entered her glove in her left hand. And she's wearing a cap with a C on it that looks a bit like the Chicago Bears logo. And she has short hair tucked up above her ears, it looks like, and a very stern, focused expression on her face. <laughs> okay. Okay. 
Do you want okay. to hear about one of the boys and, too? And just one of the one, one of the guys. Mm -hmm. Well, let me see. I need to perhaps back up then a bit uh, to show you some of that. Let's see. Give me a moment, please. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, maybe the the statue description on the uh, bottom left corner there might be appropriate. Yeah, that's a great one. So this is, well, Ray, why oh, that, don't you tell us who it is first? Then? Well, that is the amenable Leroy Satchel Page, who is the pitcher on the okay. mound, who I realized I did not describe uh, mm -hmm. in my lineup, and he is the pitcher. Okay, so we've got Leroy Satchel Page here, and he is standing tall with his hands in front of his midsection with his glove hand on top of his bare hand and looking off to his left with his cap over his eyes and his jersey says, it looks like monarchs across the front. Yes. Mm -hmm. And he also has those baggy belted pants. And this is a, looks like also like full size bronze statue with light shining down on it from above. But you said it was meant to recreate a night game, right? Indeed. And so that's is, like the night lights at the stadium okay. shining down on him. That's right. That's so cool. he's peering into the catcher, uh, preparing to pitch. Uh, oh, okay. So uh, it is, um, and the statue, the and the statue is meant to be life size as best as we could get. And he was a very tall man, about six feet five. Well, well, uh, exactly. And so that's what we uh, um, I, included. Any questions I can answer for you? Question. I'm actually in the Ryan, can you can we meet Paul? <laughs> okay. So no, I'm I'm here. No, no, not you. Oh, okay. Other Paul. You're good. Okay. We'll move forward then. Yeah, go ahead, Ryan. Uh this is uh another new exhibit uh that we're making changes to the museum. This includes what we call a section the integration pioneers which talks about what happened after the Negro Leagues and the players, many of them who went on to play for Major League Baseball teams. Uh, so this is one of the areas of which we are, uh, we're adding photos. And so players include uh, people like Jackie Robinson and Larry Doby, uh, Sam Jethro, Monty Irvin. Uh, it's probably a young audience, so you may not remember many of these baseball names. Um, but uh, it's a colorful exhibit that we are adding to kind of uh, make that connection. Some of those players did play in the old Negro Leagues before going on to Major League Baseball, but it also connects back to uh, the beginnings of the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, I have just a, a couple of pictures here I'm sharing of some famous people who have had small connections to the museum. Uh, we were for, we we welcome close to sixty to seventy thousand visitors in a normal year to the museum. Obviously, that's greatly impaired this year, um, primarily because we the, there are no there were no traveling baseball fans to Kansas City this year. But I'd say uh, that, you know, our weekends have been still been pretty good. We've been open since June and uh, we're still welcoming guests. And the weekends have been just about as normal as any weekend uh, in regular times. But the weekdays have been very slow without those baseball fans. But occasionally famous people do walk in the door from athletes to actors to actresses, politicians. We've had the famous and the infamous that come through the museum. Um, uh, first image features uh, the former first lady, Michelle Obama, uh, and she's wearing a, a, a Monarchs replica jersey, which we gave to her. Uh, this was actually during the 2008 campaign that she did a major event outside of the building. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, during the, So she wasn't actually first lady yet. So uh, that was during the presidential campaign. The center photograph uh, includes uh, is a uh, rapper Snoop Dogg for you rap fans. He didn't come to the museum, but he is wearing one of our signature Negro League jackets from one of our licensees and decided to sh he enjoyed it and showcased that on his Twitter feed. 
and and the third photo is of a young man who is very famous here in Kansas City and now across the nation, the quarterback of the Kansas City Chiefs, Patrick Mahomes, the Super Bowl champion, Kansas City Chiefs. And That's he right. uh, <laughs> <laughs> and he uh, wanted to wear and honor the, the uh, Negro Leagues pregame, and uh, we were able to get him a jersey. Okay. Uh, and there's one last photo. I, uh, we were honored a few years ago to have actor Chadwick Boseman here. Um, some of you recall him as the star of the film uh, The Black Panther, which was very famous, uh, black action superhero. But before that, he played in the biopic 42, which was a homage to Jackie Robinson. And uh, he and Harrison Ford, who played Branch Rickey, uh, general manager of the Dodgers came to the museum uh, for red carpet film and uh, uh, media, and uh, he uh, was very gracious uh, and signed autographs and did all kinds of things with staff and others and fans who showed up at the museum. So, of course, we lost him this year uh, and uh, very sad, but uh, great memories uh, of the young man. By the way, I, I really love the movie 42. Yeah. yeah, it's a great movie. And a lot of people ask me about how truthful it was. And um, I think it, it had a lot of accuracies to it. Um, although there was only one scene about the Negro Leagues, or the two scenes about the Negro Leagues at the beginning. And it kind of sets the stage for mm -hmm. a lot of people's conversation on the Negro Leagues because you're, most people obviously have heard of Jackie Robinson. Uh, but may not have known that he played in these leagues and that it was a springboard for his baseball career. Um, uh, so we're starting in the middle of the story. Robinson is really the middle of the story where it may be the beginning for a lot of other people. Uh, so what were the Negro Leagues? We tried to define what the Negro Leagues were uh, and why are they significant? They're especially significant this year because uh, we note that the founding of what we call the Negro Leagues began in 1920. So this is the year it marks the 100th anniversary of that founding of one specific league, the Negro National League, uh, which was, uh, which I'll explain shortly. So I'm showing you a photograph of Earl Taborn, who was one of the catchers for the Kansas City Monarchs and played from Illinois and played in many places, including Latin America. Uh, but we're narrating about what were the Negro Baseball League. So I'll read. It says that is the business structure representing the highest level of professional baseball available to African-American and Latino athletes. It's very important during the late 19th century through the mid 20th century. And the Negro Leagues existed because of racial segregation in America. And the role of African-Americans and Latino athletes in baseball can be studied from about 1860 to 1960 in American history. Uh, so that's a broad definition. Um, we focus on the, the primary history between 1920 and 1960. Um, I'm showing you a slide of... Um, a gentleman, there are two photos of Andrew Rube Foster. So who is Foster? Foster was a was from Calvert, Texas, born in 1879, uh, was an outstanding athlete in his own right, uh, son of a minister, uh, but outstanding pitcher uh, uh, in the early 1900s, traveled early on to Cuba and places like that, ended up in Philadelphia as an athlete and in Chicago. Uh, helped to lead teams in Chicago and ultimately after pitching injuries, though became a manager and team leader. Uh, he became a very prominent person in African-American baseball history, so much so uh, that uh, he was able to um, really recruit very good talent in and around 1915, 1916 uh, through the 1920s um, and um, pulled together some great teams. Ultimately, he became the, the leader of a team called the Chicago American Giants. Uh, 
but there were a number of other black baseball teams around the country, uh, most of them in the Midwest, but all over the country, but mostly in the Midwest. And everyone was kind of playing here and there, playing against even white com competition, playing against other black teams. And everyone, many of them were claiming in advertisements, we're the best team, we're the, we're the, for the word colored champions. We don't use the word colored anymore, but our Negro, but that's what they would say. We're the colored champions. No, we're the colored champions. There was no way to organize that and do that on the field without a league structure. All the teams agreeing to play a regular schedule with common opponents, maybe having a postseason, some revenue sharing and settle the, the debates on the baseball diamond. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, under his primary guidance, although there were many others involved, uh, they, uh, these independent baseball team owners uh, came together in February of 1920 at the YMCA building on Paseo Boulevard, which is right around the corner from our museum. So this YMCA is a segregated YMCA. It's a black YMCA that was built by the black community uh, 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 to service the community. Uh, and it became a meeting place and this became the place where all these different baseball uh, 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 people came together from St. Louis and Chicago and Indianapolis and Dayton, Ohio uh, uh, and other places to in Detroit to manage to create a league structure which became the Negro National League. So historically, keep in mind that the Negro Leagues is coming out of this period, uh, I'm going to say between World War I, 1915, 1917, through 1919, what's happening in America. Some very interesting things which we're learning about now. We're in the midst of a national and worldwide pandemic in 1917, the, the so-called Spanish flu. Uh, the end of World War I uh, brings a lot of very interesting changes to America, including the participation of African Americans in the war effort, many of them coming back from Europe, uh, demanding certain rights, but being met with virulent racism. Uh, the, the country explodes in race riots between 1918 and 1919 uh, in Texas, uh, St. Louis, Chicago, just brutal violence is happening uh, and racial protests is happening in this time. The response to that uh, is the so-called Harlem Renaissance. African-Americans take pride uh, in their blackness and in their connections to Africa. And you get this, this explosion of art and music and everything else that comes out of that. And out of that mix is to this, this push for black owned businesses, including what would become the Negro Leagues, which is primarily a black uh, enterprise. Um, the, although rival leagues would form in the East, which had a lot of white interest as well, uh, but most of the Midwest teams were part of the Negro National League. And then these rival leagues formed in the East called the Eastern Colored League. And even in the South, the Negro Southern League briefly uh, was there. So when we say leagues, it's not just one league, it's leagues, plural, uh, is the summation of the Negro leagues. Okay. Oh, this is Paul. Um, um, yeah. If I can, I'll jump in with a question. Sure. You know, we were talking the other day, and I'll just give you a segue to mention this. Um, Bingo Long and the Traveling All-Stars. <laughs> okay. Uh, hardly anybody, well, People on the call know what I'm talking about. Most of the rest of you probably don't, except for Schrader. But um, would you know, talk about that movie, its significance, its inaccuracy, but also its rarity, if you would, please. So I'll briefly talk about that. So the, the film is called The Bingo Long Traveling All-Stars and Motor Kings, which is based on a 1973 novel by William Brashler of the same title. Um, Brashler's book... Um, was inspired in part by interviews he had done with former players like uh, James Bell and others that he met. And he created a fictionalized story about a, uh, a baseball team uh, that were, uh, the individual members were at one point uh, members of the Negro League teams, but were felt that they were being treated unfairly, decided to uh, abandon those teams and create their own traveling team 
which uh, in most nomenclature is called barnstorming, where they mm -hmm. play exhibition games against all competition outside of the league and, and uh, uh, became as popular as the league players. And they were uh, one team in particular uh, were, were trying to resist against the owner of that team who was trying to thwart their efforts. Um, and so the film is based on the same premise of the book, but uh, which came out a few years later. It, it, about 1976, the movie rights were bought by Motown Records uh, uh, through their partnership with Universal Pictures. Um, and uh, a, a film version was developed. Uh, I mentioned that there was a, a young pr director that they had contracted early on in the process, but then he left to do some of his own projects, and that was Steven Spielberg. Um, they got a different director named John Badham, uh, who later did Saturday Night Fever. Uh, uh, but he developed uh, the, the uh, film through Motown, and uh, they were able to get uh, star Billy D. Williams, uh, James Earl Jones, and Richard Pryor to play the different roles. I should point out the Bingo Long character initially was the catcher, uh, was the star in the in the book, but it was flipped uh, to be the pitcher in the film. And of course, uh, Billy D. Williams was the star, and uh, he was the Black Clark Gable, many would say. Uh, and uh, you're not going to put a catcher's mask on the Black Clark Gable. So, uh, so he became the pitcher <laughs> in the film. <laughs> and James Earl Jones is uh, the catcher, uh, and it's a wonder. It's it's a very interesting uh, piece, and uh, it's based on a lot of truth in terms of how the film was done, but the team was turned into a vaudeville-like clown team of which were, uh, uh, were part of the Negro Leagues, those kinds of teams. But as it was, that film came out in 1976, the same year as Rocky and the Bad News Bears. Uh, so it had in that summer uh, and was the only film adaptation of Negro League or Black Baseball uh, to ever appear in theaters actually before or since. And so, um, uh, so there's a lot of truth in it, but a lot of uh, non-truths in that it seemed to summarize the entire Negro Leagues of which many of the former players recoiled. Um, yeah. So it's controversial in that way. Uh, mm -hmm. But what we know is that, you know, but what, what you have though with most of the leagues there were clown teams like that. And, and most of them in the Indianapolis Clowns, who we mentioned that had the female players, was the chief team among them. But during this period between 1920 and 1960, you know, the teams ebbed and flowed financially and through whatever is happening in the country, trying to na navigate segregated travel and all these other things. Um, you had teams all over the country playing professionally, playing to large crowds, uh, playing to small crowds, mostly in league play in major cities, but occasionally in exhibition play uh, in smaller communities, playing all competition regardless of color. And the only reason that they might not, for example, have played against a white team is if the, if the laws and the books prevented white and black from playing together. Uh, so um, it was a, a great deal of success uh, for many uh, communities around the country and brought economic stability to some of these communities as well. Ray, I would like to interject here and ask Paul Schrader uh, if you have any questions at this point as well. I, I'm happy to, uh, I'm happy to hear the stories. Okay. <laughs> okay. And I apologize, I had to duck away for a minute, so I, I did miss a little. I do, I do, uh, I do hope we'll sort of touch on uh, bringing things up even into the to the present, if you will, in terms of black players in baseball and what's happening mm -hmm. with that. I yes. know sure. An issue that yes. baseball is struggling with in many ways. Yes. Yes, we'll definitely talk about that. But since we do have guests uh, from, from the Maryland area, I did add a couple of slides to talk about a little bit about that history uh, among the teams. Uh, we mentioned the D.C. area and the Homestead Grays, of uh, being one of those teams that the Grays moved from Pittsburgh to DC in the forties uh, to play at Griffith Stadium. But before that in the Baltimore area, there were the Baltimore Black Sox, uh, which played in the in the late twenties into the early thirties. 
more t more people may remember a team called the Baltimore Elite Giants, spelled elite, but it's pronounced elite. <laughs> That's important. <laughs> Don't be a rookie. Pronounce it elite, okay? Okay. Uh, so, um, what's notable about the Elite Giants is that that is a team that actually moved around a lot. They were in Nashville and uh, in other places in the South and in the Midwest before ultimately landing in Baltimore uh, and uh, had some very successful teams. This image shows the team from around 1949. Uh, and this was right after. Uh, uh, so this is post integration of baseball, which we'll talk about, but still a great team. And they won the Negro Leagues championship in that year. Ray, was that the team that had the million dollar infield that people referred to? The so-called million dollar infield. Uh, I think that was actually the Newark Eagles, but uh, one player uh, who was part of the Eagles was on this team and he wasn't an infielder, but he has a connection to Baltimore uh, as well. And that is Leon Day. If you can see the photograph, he's sitting on the first row, bottom right. And I want to talk about Mr. Day because he's also among uh, other players uh, uh, um, that were part of many important teams. You mentioned uh, the the Eagles, and he was a pitcher on that Newark Eagles team for a 1946 championship, but played in Baltimore and lived there near the end of his life. Um, and was uh, Leon Day, some folks may who live in Baltimore may have heard of the Leon Day Foundation, which is operating there, uh, trying to help young people with ball fields uh, and uh, raising money for youth baseball. Uh, and he passed away. Uh, he's one of the great pitchers in, in black baseball history and is inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, so there's a photo of him with mm -hmm. the Newark Eagles there at the top uh, left. And so one of the kind of bittersweet stories, though, is that he was in the hospital when the news came of his selection uh, for induction into the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Um, and, 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 and again, we're not a Hall of Fame here at the Baseball Museum. Um, we are a museum. Uh, we don't want to create a segregated Hall of Fame. We don't consider ourselves a Hall of Fame. We don't induct anybody into the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. Uh, because the Negro Leagues existed because of segregation in America. We don't want a segregated Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. But Mr. Day was honored there. And uh, as I said, this was back in 90, oh boy, 97, 98. I, I may have the dates wrong, but he was hospitalized, but did learn of the news of his honor. But then he passed away just a few days later. Um, other folks with connection to Baltimore uh, and baseball history uh, include uh, Joe Black, uh, we have a photo of Joe Black uh, there who uh, played with Day on the Baltimore Eli Giants, uh, but later would be recruited by the Brooklyn Dodgers and become one of the uh, among the first pitchers, black pitchers in, in uh, Major League Baseball uh, when he joined the Dodgers in the 50s. Outstanding talent, uh, played in Baltimore and went to college in Baltimore. And wow, the, the name of the school just escaped me. Uh, was African -American, historically African American college that is uh, in Maryland there, and the name just went out of my head. I'm sorry, as somebody probably knows that the name of that school. It'll but... come to me in a minute because now that I... would be Howard University. No, not Howard not University. Howard? That's oh, in Washington no. D.C. No, oh, don't please don't mix them up. You'll have alumni fighting each other. Oh, please yeah. don't do that. Uh oh, uh oh. <laughs> but it's definitely not Howard University. No. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, but it'll be in Maryland. But anyway, he did attend that college and uh, let's say play with the elite giants and then would go on and be a, a, a pioneer for the Dodgers. Uh, and, but maybe, maybe the one of the more famous Baltimore elite giant players uh, was a, a young catcher from Philadelphia uh, who in his later high school years, uh, his parents reluctantly allowed him to go play baseball, but he was an outstanding catcher and would join the Brooklyn Dodgers in 1948 uh, future most valuable player Roy Campanella. Uh -huh. uh, so um, we have the pictures of those three. And so that's the connections of many to that region, which was rich uh, with baseball history. Okay. So getting close to the end here. So wrapping up 
the World War II, um, the 1940s, is a major revelation. So African Americans are fighting valiantly, as they did in World War One. Uh, against Nazis and fascism in Europe, uh, but not being allowed certain rights back home in the United States. Uh, among them uh, is the ability to be able to play uh, baseball in the major leagues. And even though the Negro Leagues were were operating, um, many thought that the irony of not being able to play, considering what was happening in the world, was something that should be uh, highlighted. Uh, we have this magazine cover which shows a, f a player, Ernest Spoon Carter, with the Washington Grays um, uh, in the backdrop of a black soldier uh, as well. Uh, and Washington is an important area to discuss because what's so what's happening, World War II, the white teams and the black teams are losing players to the war effort players being drafted uh, uh, and the like. Um, so the quality of play is diminished in both leagues, uh, but less so in the black leagues because many of the star players like Satchel Paige and Josh Gibson were either past fighting age or um, didn't qualify for the war. So you still have a pretty high level of play in the black leagues. And, and in places like Washington, D.C. especially, white fans certainly went to watch those black games at Griffith Stadium, uh, speaking of Howard University, because old Griffith Stadium is now the site of Howard University Hospital in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. uh, so oh, what does that mean? So white fans could go on Sunday games to see the Negro Leagues. We usually play, rented a stadium from the great, from the uh, Washington Senators, rented the stadium on Sundays and weekends. And you're a white fan, you can go watch the, the Grays play and you see these outstanding players like Buck Leonard and Gibson and others, but come back on Tuesday and watch the Senators. Um, the Grays at this point are in a stretch of nine straight Negro League uh, uh, playoff appearances and championships. The Senators may have been one of the worst teams in Major League Baseball history. Yes. Uh, so what is this, the slogan for the Senators Washington? Uh, first in war, first in peace, last in the American League East. So uh, <laughs> you're a white fan. You're, you, you saw both teams. You're wondering, well, why can't we have those other players? It's just because of the color of their skin. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, and black fans, they watched the Senators, they watched the Yankees, they watched the Red Sox too, and they wanted to see this happen. Uh, the black press is pushing this issue. The communist press is pushing this as a labor issue. So this is a very important uh, a time uh, uh, in American history. So enter Jack Roosevelt Robinson. Um, Jack Robinson is a... Uh, 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 part of a large family from Cairo, Georgia, uh, son of sharecroppers in Georgia. Uh, but the family escaped sharecropping uh, uh, to move to Pasadena, California when he was quite young. He was born in 1919. They would go all the way across country to settle in Pasadena, California with extended family, uh, uh, settled on Pepper Street where he was raised. His, his, his mother, Mally, was a domestic who worked in and around Southern California. And he grew up with his brothers, um, one in particular, Mac, who was a great athlete and would go on to college and become an Olympian in 1936 with Jesse Owens as a teammate wow. uh, on the track team. Uh, and Jack, who also had equal athletic abilities, maybe even better, came along and broke all his brother's high school and AAU track and field records. So I'm showing you a collage of photographs of different athletic endeavors in which Robinson participated, including baseball at UCLA. He also played football at UCLA. Uh, there's a football photo there of him with Kenny Washington and Willie Strode, uh, who were uh, future NFL players among the first African-Americans to play in the National Football League. Robinson played basketball, noted that he ran track and field. Uh, he was actually pretty good at tennis. The only thing he couldn't do well was swim, which is a whole nother lecture. We'll save that for another time. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> so outstanding athlete, um, outstanding individual, uh, someone who grew up with a lot of race pride, if you will, in Southern California. Played in integrated environments. Uh, as well. So 
um, he understood certain limitations and things like that. Um, he went to, he was drafted into the military, um, was recruited, uh, uh, actually was stationed near here at Fort Riley, Kansas, which is the first infantry, uh, lobbied his way into officer's training school, which was something that black soldiers could not do initially. He had the help of a friend named Joe Lewis, the boxer who ended up coming to the base as well. Um, was assigned a lieutenant, uh, was then moved to Texas at Fort Hood, Texas, where he was in charge of a tank battalion and training them for the European theater. But his football ankle injuries would prevent him from going overseas. Um, and going to a hospital one day to check on his ankle, uh, he rode on a civilian bus uh, from the hospital back to the barracks where he sat next to the wife of a friend uh, that he knew a fellow soldier's friend. And the young lady was very fair skinned and looked white. The bus driver took umbrage to him sitting there and ordered him to move to the back of the bus. He refused vehemently. Got to the station, the, the driver um, um, told the MPs at the uh, base what he had done and he was arrested and then brought up on court martial charges. Um, he beat the court martial, was successful, but then was honorably discharged from the military. Didn't have a job, needed something to do, wanted to marry his fiance, Rachel. Um, found out about the Kansas City Monarchs baseball team uh, and signed up uh, to play with the Monarchs. Here's a photo of him with teammate in 1945, Leroy Satchel Page. Uh, Robinson plays one year with the Kansas City Monarchs and simultaneously at the time, the Brooklyn Dodgers had begun an effort to try to recruit African-American players. Robinson is 26 years old at this time. Uh, so kind of old for a, a rookie baseball player, but had a lot of different life experiences and was a great raw, talented athlete, but not necessarily the best player in the Negro League. Some would say the most charismatic and best player was his teammate Paige, but uh, Paige was a little older, <laughs> uh, but um, also um, was uh, someone who probably may not have wanted to take a chance on integration. But they, they, they recruited Robinson, talked to him, and convinced him uh, of the protections that they could make for him if he was willing to make some sacrifices. He agreed and uh, ultimately signed a contract with the Dodgers, uh, became uh, an infielder for them, and played uh, in a minor league team in Montreal, and ultimately uh, joined the, the, the main team in April of 1947. Um, there were four other players that year in April in 47, who also joined him uh, to play uh, Major League Baseball. Uh, first among them was a player named Hank Thompson. Actually, Hank Thompson and Willard Brown. I, I'm showing a photo just of Thompson. Both Brown and Thompson played for the Kansas City Monarchs in the Negro Leagues, and they signed with the St. Louis Browns in, Jul in, uh, in uh, July of 19. Uh, 1947. And let me just back up. The Thompson and Brown were not the next players. The actual next player was Larry Doby. Doby played with the Cleveland Indians um, in, in early July of 1947, was the first African American in the American League. Thompson and Brown soon followed. And then later on, Dan Bankhead was a pitcher with the Dodgers in September of that year. Um, but Thompson's success, he eventually left St. Louis and went to New York uh, to join Willie Mays by this time. And uh, the Giants, the New York Giants at that time, would become uh, World Series champions. But Thompson and Doby and Robinson's success also opened the door from uh, uh, Latino players. Uh, we're showing a photo of Orestes Minoso or Mini Minoso right. when he played with the New York Cubans. Um, Minoso was considered the Latin Jackie Robinson, uh, was certainly mm -hmm. an important predecessor to players like Roberto Clemente, but born in mm -hmm. Cuba, played many years in the Negro Leagues before being ultimately being drafted by the Cleveland Indians and then traded to the Chicago White Sox. 
And he uh, was part of the so-called go-go White Sox, who eventually would win a World Series in the American League in the 1950s. Um, their player success opened the door for coaches. Um, this is a photo of John Jordan Buck O'Neill. Uh, O'Neill was a coach and manager with the Kansas City Monarchs, first baseman as well. Um, after the end of the Negro Leagues, became a scout in Major League Baseball with the Chicago Cubs, recruiting many important former Negro Leaguers like Ernie Banks to the Cubs, then becoming a coach with the Cubs in 1962, the first African-American to do so. Um, and then later on, uh, after coaching and scouting, uh, would become chairman of our museum and a volunteer and someone who was a star in the Ken Burns documentary uh, on baseball in the 1990s. Um, but what was good for uh, baseball was not necessarily good for the Negro Leagues. It was good for the community. But by 1960, the Negro Leagues had begun to fade away as uh, an organization. Uh, of baseball teams. But I want to talk to you about the statistic that relates to the different players and the importance of what it meant to have the integration of baseball. Uh, I'm showing you a chart of a list, two lists. So we have the different awards that were won by African American and Hispanic players. Uh, between 1947 and 1960. And I should emphasize, we mentioned, it's important to mention the, uh, the Latino players because players like Minoso were Afro-Latino, so he's dark-skinned, whereas there were white Cubans or white Spanish players who could play Major League Baseball as early as the 1920s. But if you were dark-skinned, you played with the black players in the Negro Leagues and during the same things that they did. Uh, so the first list we talk about is the Rookie of the Year list. Uh, these were first-year players, outstanding first-year player list, which that award is now called the Jackie Robinson Memorial Award. And Robinson was the first winner of that award in 1947. Don Newcomb, Sam Jethro, Willie Mays, Joe Black, Junior Gilliam, Frank Robinson, Orlando Cepeda, and William McCovey are all the award winners between 1947 and 1959, dominating the Rookie of the Year awards. Uh, the mm -hmm. most valuable player awards are now named, uh, were named the Kennesaw Mountain Landis Memorial Award which was the former commissioner of baseball, uh, who uh, was not necessarily someone open to integration. In fact, there, we, we just got a note uh, from the Baseball Writers Association, and they're going to rename this award, removing Mr. Landis' name from the award. Still, between, 19, uh, between this time period, uh, Black and Latino players dominating this award, including Robinson in 49, Roy Campanella twice in 51 and 53, Willie Mays, um, Campanella three times, I should say, in 55 as well, Don Newcomb, Harry Aaron, and Ernie Banks twice in the late 50s. So uh, it seemed ludicrous to have kept them out uh, uh, all this time. And of course, baseball now recognizes uh, their historic roles and many of them are inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame, as I noted, not just the players in the Negro Leagues, but those who came after. Uh, uh, some who started in the Negro Leagues, but whose careers took off in the major leagues, including Henry Aaron and Ernie Banks, among others. And then, of course, a number of the Negro Leaguers who are immortalized in the statues on the field and some others who aren't, like Norman Turkey Stearns, Ray Brown, and even Willard Brown, who I mentioned had a brief career in the major leagues, uh, but came back to the Negro Leagues and uh, became an outstanding home run hitter. Uh, called him in, in Puerto Rico, they call him Ese Hombre, so the man. So that's how important he was. <laughs> All right. So Ray, as we wind up to the top of the hour, um, would you mind sharing with all of us um, who might want to purchase anything, um, your information uh, for your um, store. Well, very good. We're glad to share that first. Um, one quick announcement, if I would. Uh, if you all are interested in listening to more stories on the Negro Leagues, the museum uh, is hosting its annual celebration in remembrance of Buck O'Neill uh, on Friday, November 13th, 1230 Central Time, uh, conversation between uh, uh, 
filmmaker Ken Burns and Joe Posnaski, hosted by sports announcer Bob Costas, uh, with our guest Bob Kendrick, who's our president. And Mr. O'Neill uh, was someone, again, who was uh, uh, noteworthy uh, for his role here in Kansas City, but um, in uh, helping to bring the Negro Leagues and the memory of the Negro Leagues to life. That will be on our Facebook page, which is uh, uh, Negro Leagues Baseball Museum on Facebook, and you can get that live stream there. Uh, we do have our website, which is nlbm.com with the store, um, uh, where we do sell lots of merchandise from the different regions um, of baseball teams. If you're wanting to also learn a little bit more about the history, we have our NLBE Museum, which is for teachers primarily, but you can go there and research a name of a player or someone like that. Uh, and that's nlbemuseum.com. Uh, and then we're, as I noted, we're also on Facebook, but the, the store is nlbm.com, which is our main website and our uh, store website. Well, thank you very much. Um, do you um, have anything you wanna share as we conclude? Oh, no, we just hope that if you're wanting to come, and visit. We are open uh, right now, and hopefully we can remain open. It is safe to do so. We're doing all we can to keep visitors safe and uh, uh, a good place to learn about anything that might be happening regionally uh, with Negro Leagues that might be of interest to anyone is to go to our Facebook page where we try to update and maintain where there are activities that may not necessarily be activities that we host, but uh, folks can learn about books and, and, and speakers and other things. So I'm grateful to have this opportunity, this unique experience with you all, and hope that you've enjoyed uh, hearing about the history. Well, Ray, this has could, been delightful and there's so much wonderful history. And I, 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 um, I am sure there's a bunch of things that uh, people will wanna continue to engage with because the way baseball has entwined with American history, the way segregation and integration and know, battles have entwined. entwined. It's just, it's all summed up here in this baseball story, which is a great way to look at it. Yeah, well, thank hours, you. just not enough time. I mean, <laughs> clearly we could just go on and on because- oh, I'm yeah, sorry. Lots of questions. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, perhaps I talk too much, but- uh, no, 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 not at all. We were all well, wrapped. <laughs> I do appreciate I do appreciate the fact that yes we we've been engaged in these conversations especially over social justice this past summer and we're we're able to just to provide this extra historical context and sports is at least a ground that we can start having these conversations and we like to root for our community teams and know about our community history so mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately though you'll see from this history we're still kind of fighting some of the same issues we fought yes. 100 years yeah. and 50 years ago yeah. so that's important to be reminded of that and don't forget it yeah. Well, and I, I want to chime in here real quickly uh, and thank you, Julia. Um, I know I didn't ask for a lot of description today. That's okay. But Happy to be here. <laughs> yeah, I, I just want to remind um, viewers who are blind who may or may not have IRA uh, as a service or use IRA as a service that the extra added benefit, of course, of having Ray um, share this content along with the IRA agent um, is it's just doubly good um, because the agents are just expert at description and provide so much, um, you know, extra for us, um, those of us who are blind or visually impaired. And so just being able to listen to you, Ray, describe the, um, the, the experience. I'm at a loss for words because I, I love baseball and I, this has just been a joy to to uh, share this spacey moment with you. So thank you so much. Well, I'm honored. And the school was Morgan State. I was yeah. gonna say, I knew okay. that too, Ray, thanks. I knew there'd be people yelling at us about it. <laughs> I'll apologize to all the Morgan yeah. State people, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it I just came know. to me, so I didn't, wanna, I didn't wanna forget that. Oh, thank right. you. <laughs> so appreciate that. Well, I would like to thank you, Stephanie, Paul Mims, Paul yes. Schrader, and Ryan Bishop, all from Ira, and our very special guest, Ray Doswell from the Negro League Baseball Museum. Ray, you can come back anytime you want to afternoon at the museum, believe me. <laughs> Happy to do it. Thank you. I think we could we could literally spend hours here. And if you all want to take a look at 
this particular museum, it will be made part of our uh, museum offer through the end of the year. So you can browse this museum with one of our agents like Julia, who can take you through that gift shop. Now I'm now I'm kind of interested. I have to find out if the, what Ohio teams there were, if there were any. So oh, I'm yeah. going to have to go find yeah. that out. But, Cleveland Buckeyes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. So wonderful. Well, our next afternoon at the museum will be on November 20th. And with that, we will announce what that museum will be soon. Um, we are looking at a couple. So if you have suggestions of museums you'd like to see, you can send those to support at ira.io. This has been Janine Stanley for Ira and Afternoon at the Museum.